Okay, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Christina Bethel. She is a professor at Johns Hopkins University and the Bloomberg School of Public Health and in the School of Medicine. Her research focuses on building and translating the science of healthy developments to promote early and lifelong health of children, families, and communities. Dr. Bethel is the founding director of the Child and Adolescent Health Measurement Initiative, which since 1996 has worked to promote early and lifelong health of children, youth, and families through family-centered data, tools, and research. She developed an advance to national and state use and, and research and policy, an area and array of child and family health measures addressing the social and relational roots of well-being and the quality of healthcare systems and structures that influence child and family well-being. And this includes nationally and internationally used measures of the family-centered medical home, adverse childhood experiences, positive childhood experiences, family resilience and connection, child flourishing, and the whole child risk index. Her research has shaped policies regarding adverse childhood experiences, relational health promotion, including the National Prioritizing Possibilities Agenda to prevent and address ACEs and promote child health, health equity, providing testimony to the U.S. House Committee on Oversight and Reform and identifying, preventing, and treating childhood trauma, informing the American Academy of Pediatrics Relational Health Policy Statement and the design of the Engagement in Action Framework to catalyze statewide integrated relational systems of care to promote child, youth, and family well-being. Dr. Bethel earned an MBA and MPH from the University of California, Berkeley, and her PhD in public policy and health services research and policy from the University of Chicago. She dances, writes poetry, and believes in authentic connection with ourselves, others, and life is the source of our creativity and joy. What a great introduction. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, actually, I didn't know you were going to read all of that, but it does traverse a lot of what I'm going to be talking with you about today um, in a hopefully more detail, and then we'll have some time to discuss afterwards. So thank you again for the honor and opportunity, um, Dean Bradley and, and Jen and um, Dr. Krugman, who I'm assuming is online, who have all conspired to um, get me here today through the weather and Michelle also and Dana <laughs> helping me get, get where I am. So thank you very much. So um, first, I just want to make a disclosure. I don't have any financial relationships to disclose or conflicts of interest to resolve. Um, but I do want to admit that I do have a specific aim, and it's been with me a long time, which I also find interesting. It's like, why have I always kind of been up to this or interested in this? And, and so I'm going to reflect on that in a minute. But what's exciting is that at least through the trajectory of my life, we really built a lot of science, almost um, documenting what, what lived experience might tell you is actually true, right? But we need the research. We need the science. Um, to do that, but we have, I, I think, an integrated uh, science of thriving that brings together all of our sciences of neurodevelopment and attachment and resilience and um, even epigenetics and all of those things. So I'm excited about the possibilities we're living in today. Um, so today I hope to trace a journey, which is a little bit of my journey, but it isn't mine. It's it's a whole cohort of people and partners uh, really trying to put forward translational frameworks, measures, data, research, and policy action to ride the wave of the science, to help build the science, and really move it toward a positive health approach to public health, where we look at flourishing and back up from there, what gets in the way, and being able to set our sights on well-being and creating a health system and a public health system and schools and others that are focused on that. So I wanna set forth a paradigm and share a little bit of the trajectory of the research that at least um, took us to a, a place of being able to start to um, interact within the policy sphere. And with that, I'll share a example, deeper dive example on early childhood health systems integration uh, through the engagement and action framework. And there's a lot going on in Colorado, a lot of leadership here going on in that space. So I'm excited to hear what you think and to discuss some of the possibilities for going forward. Uh, because even though we've come a long way, we have a lot more to do. Yeah. So I wanted to reflect a little bit on my own background and how I came to this. Um, paradigms, as we know, are strong forces in our culture, and we're always, we're always in the middle of paradigms. To be aware of them is important. Um, but when I was growing up, 
plate tectonics wasn't even agreed to, like how do, how do you know, different continents get to where they are. And um, the idea that earth, sky and water work together in a way to create our, our earth and its geography was not even really agreed to at that time. The other was um, very mechanistic view in many ways of even nature. I'm not saying that the experts in the field thought this, but the general paradigm is that things operate in, in mechanistic buckets in many ways. And now we of course know that trees and fungi and everything work together and nurture each other even. So it looks like this idea of connectedness and nurturance is really in the fabric of our, uh, of our life in every level. And then of course we had a very biological deterministic view of, of health. And that's evolved completely where we have the eco bio developmental model and have been living in a time where we get to, um, you know, do some research to bring that in. Because even though we know that our biology and our environment and our um, ecology and all of that work together for well being, we still have systems that are not necessarily reflecting that. So there's been a lot of work to do. But I just reflect on what a paradigm shifting um, time it's been for me since I came to this work. Um, earlier in my life. And I fell in love with um, the idea of competent communities really early on in high school, actually. I was very involved in the community and with elderly people in nursing homes and just noticed how things weren't quite set up to support their well-being and started sort of doing some advocacy work with the Chamber of Commerce some, for some reason to get wheelchair access to parks. And, you know, and the idea that you could have a lot of competent people in a community, but that doesn't mean the community is competent unless it's working intentionally together. So I really fell in love with that as a big strategy for addressing what, even when I was very young, I could see were a lot of suffering a lot of variation in suffering, people with similar levels of adversity doing differently. I was curious about that. And it seemed to me that bringing people together in a community would be really important. But you can see by the characteristics of what a competent community is defined here uh, in 1985, that it seemed like people had to be very involved. Like if this wasn't some sort of mechanistic transactional set of things you could put it together, it was really about people. And so I got very involved in community partnerships and how can we bring people together? And the first thing we run into is, how are we doing? What's it, what's it like now? And then, well, there's no data. There wasn't, there's birth and death records and census data basically at that time. And so even though I was very involved uh, nationally with sort of the AHA and hospital groups trying to reframe how to do hospital community benefits in a way that would improve the community and shift the system to one of health and accountability and community, at the end of the day, these partnerships twofold were not really partnerships because they didn't really involve the people who lived in the community, but it was still people who are power brokers. And that's not a problem. They need to be there. But it wasn't really the voices of people who were living day by day there. And so I was very interested. This is actually from 1969, this, this partnership continuum. I always like to go back to the beginning just to remind myself how, how many brilliant people have always uh, been walking around and how we're, we're building on their work. But the main thing was that you had to empower people. So then if you invite people to come in to help improve health or healthcare or systems, it can be hard to engage and activate people. But so we really started, I really started focusing on how can we use measurement and data to engage and bring into the system, whether at a community level or in the healthcare system, activated patients, activated communities. And again, the most important part was data um, to be able to say, here's, here's what it is, here's what it could be, here's how you're involved in that. So I just kind of fell headlong into data totally against my will because <laughs> I was like, we can just all talk, right? And figure this out. And so at the time when I began my career, we didn't have any data at all in the country on child health, family health, or adolescent health outside of birth and death records and census. There was not a single national survey and even that there was no measures. And so I sort of realized I had to do something about that again against my will. I was I did my MBA and PhD, never planned on getting a PhD. But it was like, okay, if we're gonna do anything in the world, we have to measure things and tie it to money and systems and get the attention of the policy community who are actually doing a lot to set the odds in our communities. And so that's kind of um, how it all got started. And so this set in place a whole journey of measurement 
around a framework, not just measurement thrown at the wall, but around a framework for child and adolescent and family well-being. And at the time uh, the CAMI got started, we uh, brought together most of the federal agencies, a lot of state agencies, but a huge amount of families and payers and purchasers and community around three main things. What are we up to? What are the goals we're trying to achieve and how do we measure that? How do we discern and develop actionable data and tools that can be used by local areas and states and others to create transformational partnerships? So still holding true to the partnership piece as the only way through which we can make change. And yet there was a need for data and tools and that kind of thing. And so this is kind of the theory of action that just keeps, what are we trying to do? How do we know what we're doing? How do we, what tools and data do we need? So that then we can really activate the brilliance that is there about what to do and to start to move the, the piece. If you want to read about our 25 year journey, we did an article just came out in MCH journal on that. So we look at data measurement, engagement, and flourishing, and they're all connected. And I know it sounds like, okay, you're a data person. No, oh, you're, a, a, you're a, a person about policy and engagement. But for me, they went together, and I've spent a few minutes here just to try to explain how it's all part of the same thing, even though it may seem like a disconnected piece. So I'm going to go forward. Um, how many of you know about the Data Resource Center, childhealthdata.org? Okay. So basically, what ended up happening was we got the first national survey of children's health building on a lot of the measures that had been created and validated for healthcare quality assessment actually. And so working with MCHB um, created the national survey of children's health. And then this is the first resource that was created to liberate the data to the public. So literally high school students, anybody can use this. And we worked very closely on if we're going to spend $25 million a year collecting data, let's make sure people can access it. And so we built the data resource center back when it was just Excel and access, and there wasn't any back in SPSS SQL servers or anything, but we figured this out. And so I started getting into technology, IT technology and data sharing and interoperable systems so that we could free the data and basically liberate it for the public. So at the time, there wasn't a lot of data, but we've been able to create the data resource center and still run it. And you can just go on and pick your year, pick your area, pick your topic, stratify, and then get cleaned and downloaded uh, data sets that really students can use and easy to make it uh, possible. So you don't have to get a half a million dollar grant to use the data three years after it came out and then a paper four years later and that no one, very few people will read. So we were trying to really create an action arm for the uh, liberating data in the in the wild with public health agencies, with students, with researchers right now today, and also practitioners who know a lot about what's going on, but don't have the PhD level skills and they're not going to get a grant. So this has been a big part of the work is to continue to bring excellent data standardized data too, so we can compare. And we see so much variation across states and across subgroups of kids. And then that's information that we can model and understand. And so finding out um, of what's going on quickly also helps write grants and things like that. So it's been really an important thing. We need this, of course, for all the data sets that are out there, the PRAMs and so on. But that's part of what um, the journey has been. But on the other side, using the data, <laughs> this is kind of a, a flip, to really... Um, keep drawing our attention to the science of healthy development. What is it that explains the wide variation in how children do across states, across communities, within a home? What are some of the variables that are there? And the science of healthy development really growing around safe, stable, nurturing relationships, but also community, belonging, and mattering. And how can we make that a matter of public health and not something that's like, yeah, 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 that's fine, but we have that. Because when we really look at why, you know, we'll identify youth, let's say, who can use resources, but they don't want to use them, or even the dropout rates for nurse family partnerships, there's a lot of issues around trust and belonging and, and resourcing. So, so that's the other side of it is using this um, to hook it up to an agenda that could drive, drive the science. So let me explain myself a little bit more there. So when we started doing, we had to, we had to get the measures, then we had the data and now we could do some research. So it was a long journey <laughs> to be able to even start to put the story together. But at the time that the CAMI started in 1996, the CDC was just about ready to come out with their paper 
on adverse childhood experiences and being in the field, we saw it right away. And so it started to really at the very beginning of the work of the CAMI in 1996 to inform the measures and what we thought was important to measure. Um, and you all I'm sure know about adverse childhood experiences 10 years ago, that was often not the case, that it's really bringing for, forth the underlying toxic stress physiology that can occur when we have a sense of safety and stability and nurturance disrupted, what happens in the brain and the body and how it's not necessarily about the event because we like to study events, but events go together. And so you can see with adverse childhood experiences and child abuse and neglect, it, they travel together. And this idea of looking at, at this as a disease model versus as a, a um, overarching cumulative toxic stress indicator was new. Um, we didn't have it for kids. So we started getting busy working on a measure. How could we understand ad childhood adverse experiences sooner in life? Maybe when children are children or adolescents. At the same time, but it wasn't really until 2014 that it, we started to see the accumulated sciences around resilience and possibility. And that really started the science of resilience around World War II, my understanding of looking at children who'd experienced similar war kind of situations, but did differently. Like again, what is, what is it that we see this variation in how people do with similar levels of adversity? What's that about? And how can we leverage that to be able to start to not only uh, mitigate um, events that have already happened, but really get upstream to do prevention. So this is, uh, you probably all know Ann Mastin's work. So the bottom line is in 2014, before we, just before we had any data really coming out on ACEs nationally for kids, we had a, a platform called We Are the Medicine. And I don't know if you know Academy Health, but we were working with Academy Health and the Children's Hospital Association, but also about 500 other people across all the sectors from child welfare to mental health treatment and different sectors around the country. And so we all came up with this platform called We Are the Medicine, which just really emphasizes the cross-cutting role of safe, stable, nurturing relationships to healthy child brain development and across life, legitimizes the known impact of embedded and chronic stress on child development and well-being all the way through to adulthood and on. Um, the syndemic of adverse childhood experiences that indeed we were dealing, we were living with a lot of these um, events that can cause toxic stress. They're just two are different, but we, we had a lot of 61% um, of adults and so on. We didn't know yet what, what it was for kids. That's what we were about ready to do. Um, and a science about what could, what could be done, like a science that was pointing us in the direction of, of that, explaining that variation and why people with uh, similar levels of adversity do differently, what's going on in their lives. Um, and then recognizing that child development depends on adult development. So it's really a two gen, three gen kind of approach if we were gonna address this, a whole systems approach. And finally concluding that the health of children in our world really calls us to center uh, addressing, preventing child abuse and neglect and trauma and promoting positive health because getting rid of trauma we were about ready to find was not enough. Kids without any adverse childhood experiences who do not have positive protective factors are still not doing well. So it's a completely different track, but we didn't know it. So that's where the measurement work came in. But it was a, it was, it felt to me that we really need to promote positive health and well being, regardless of the adversities that we have. And then, uh, but not just only focus on high risk because it seemed like the whole population wasn't doing that great. And again, the data was just emerging. So these were hypotheses at the time. So I wanna share with you a little bit about our hypothesis testing. And some of these slides are busy, but I'm just gonna point out the main points. And some of you like to see all the data and I can share these with you if you want. But 2014 was the first time that we had in the country population-based data on ACEs, resilience, uh, school engagement, neighborhood factors from the National Survey of Children's Health. It was literally an 18 year journey of developing, validating 12 years between the time we proposed looking at ACEs and how we could measure it validly for kids and getting the data into the world because of all of the issues that go on. And can you ask people those questions? Are they valid? And that kind of thing. So basically showing that children with special health care needs is over two times higher for children who are experiencing ACEs, two or more ACEs, and also ADHD. And there's more research on, is it ADHD? Is it trauma? Of course, there's overlap. And then school uh, success 
and this in this case, repeating a grade in school, but many other school success factors. So that was important, but at the same time, making sure to not just talk about the problems, but also talk about the variation among children uh, who had these exposures and what that might be about and how we could start to be uh, moving into a protective stance. So what also came up is this concept of equally unequal. So in public health, obviously we always have to think, are we doing a high risk approach or a population-based approach? You know, does this issue lend itself to, you know, seatbelt use, a whole population thing? Yes. Is smoking a whole population thing? Well, it took them a while to figure that out. It's not just for people who smoke, but we should be looking at the whole population to make an impact. So for me, it was very important to look at how exposures varied in their prevalence, but also how once you had them, they had an impact. And again, coming back to the biological sciences and the neurobiological sciences, it looked like the prevalence of problems were similar across income groups once the exposure had taken place. And so even though there's a higher probability of having adverse childhood experiences, let's say in this case, um, for lower income people, the prevalence of mental, emotional, behavioral problems diagnosed was not that different. And uh, when we start to adjust in modeling, they're actually not different by income. Income effects go away. And so I wanted to just say that, you know, I think we do have a population-based approach that needs to be taken. Um, and also looking at the power of promoting resilience. So we can talk all day about what resilience means, and I would like to. But right now, uh, just to let you know, we did at the same time as ACEs look at building a child flourishing measure, one of the components of which is looking at resilience, um, mostly in the form of self-regulation of emotion and behavior and how that's measured. And so what we can see automatically is at every level of ACEs, there's a much lower level of mental, emotional, behavioral problems when there's this quality of self-regulation. And you may say, oh, okay, well, that's clear because these are, you know, mental lack of self-regulation is a big part of getting diagnosed with a mental, emotional, behavioral problem. But once you have children all with that problem, there's still a lot of variation in this component. So that was promising. Maybe we could do something about it. Um, and then we looked at engagement in school, which we know is such a life course predictor of well-being across life, is engagement in school, um, not necessarily not missing school, because very few children miss a lot of school, and when they do, it's an issue, but uh, the engagement in school factor was something else that we learned to measure. And what I noticed here is, of course, the impact across ACEs was impressive, but what I was most struck by was the low level of engagement, I consider 56.7 to not be that high, um, even for those without adversity. Again, for me, what is that about? What is it that, you know, even though we are lacking these strong um, adverse experiences, controlling for all the things like income and so on and so forth, we're still seeing pretty low rates um, overall. So for me, this means it's a bigger issue. It's a bigger issue that involves a lot more factors and the community and getting back to the community um, aces, if you will, and the sense of belonging and safety in a community and how that might actually start to be as important as what happens in the family, or at least really co-occurring in a way that really called us to not just focus in on families, but to focus in on the community, which is kind of where my whole work um, started. So this was another study that was done that looked at school engagement by those flourishing factors. And there were three big factors that we were able to get in the survey, worked with trial trends for a number of years on what could we measure that captured flourishing at different age groups that varies. Um, one is staying calm and in control when faced with a challenge, which is sort of that indicator of self-regulation. And seeing that when it was high, school engagement went up to all the way to 83%. So it really did look again like there was something we could do to move it. And it wasn't just knowing about risks and getting rid of risks. It was about promoting something positive. And so this was important piece for, for at least me to give courage to keep going with, with what is that, what are those positive factors that we could measure? So this is just a little pit stop. Um, Dean Bradley had mentioned that we did a national agenda in 2017. It seems it was took four years. We worked with all kinds of communities and things. But by the time we got to the agenda, instead of calling it getting rid of ACEs, it was prioritizing possibilities. And so it was really, a, it was about 72 field building activities that we did. And everyone had to agree on 
what it would be, but turning intentionally toward a possibilities framework was um, a big deal. And then you certainly run right into ACEs and child abuse and neglect and all of the other factors, but doing it through the lens of what's possible seemed to really make a difference in how people were engaging with the process and also the sense of hope about what we could do about it. So just letting you know, we have this agenda and the engagement and action framework I'm going to talk about in a little bit is more of an applied version of this for early child, early care and education or early childhood health systems, excuse me. But in this, and I don't know if um, Dr. Mays is in the room, is he in the room? No, we're online. You told me about him in health policy and management. So a lot of my background has been in health policy and looking at the detailed pieces that when you go to work with clinicians or even teachers, or the people in the front lines who are going to be doing this work, what are the things that get in the way of being able to implement and translate even evidence-based research? And, it, and for providers, it comes a lot down to, can I code for it? Can I get paid for it? Uh, is it paid well enough for me to spend the time? Uh, what am I held accountable for? Does it conflict with doing this? If I'm held accountable for this, you can't expect me to do that because this is my, this is what my livelihood is. Um, capacity and training, of course, you know, most providers at the time didn't know anything about the science, busy people. How do we educate and bring new knowledge into the field? So this is a very important area of interest of mine is the translation, the implementation and scaling of knowledge and being very active in that area. And hopefully not having it take so long, right? Um, but it has taken a long time. Also getting into credentialing and integration of services because so many of the practitioners that were available to support families and children and youth are not necessarily licensed professionals, but they weren't even allowed to come into the settings in which they might be needed. And so credentialing the teams like doulas now and community health workers is a big deal. So there's those factors. And then coordination. How do we share data between schools and healthcare so we don't have to pelt youth with the same survey 10 times, but really make it about them and share data. And so these were the issues that kept coming up to ground. So I'm very into the vision, as you can tell, but the first thing is, okay, who needs to change and what are the issues and factors they're facing? And it always ends up coming down to a lot of policy factors. These Some of these are big P policy, some of these are small P policy, but how do we really actually create um, some of the big uh, policy factors to translate this into practice? So all of this work, uh, we did work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, sparked a lot of conversations because we knew there were policy issues. So the first thing the federal government does when you bring an issue is, why is this a federal government issue? Why That sounds really important, but why is it a policy issue? And so the work of saying, okay, here's how it's a policy issue. Here's what you could do in policy uh, was just beginning at that time. And we had the campaign for trauma-informed policy and practice. And it was actually harder than I thought to articulate, not just awareness building, but what does it mean? You know, how do I, as a Senator, put a bill together and, and really give you give them details on if you do this and this and this, why would that help states and local areas do something better? Or why would that support universities or researchers to, to take action? And so that's kind of the work that happened from there. And if I have time or anybody wants to see it, I'd really like to show you Elijah Cummings' opening statement. But one of my highlights of being in Baltimore was working with Elijah Cummings. Do you know who he is? Amazing man. Uh, he's passed now, but we did a series of of events across the country based off of the congressional testimony. And, you know, it really sparked a lot. So it matters, it matters to advocate. I don't know how to be in this field without being an advocate and empowering people to be an advocate, bringing stories and data together. And so again, the big part of my work around advocacy has been informing family advocates, community advocacy groups on the data, the science, so they, they can move with it, but really bring their stories and really talk about what would really be helpful. And so that integration of, of community and data and policy again, uh, coming up further and further. So any questions? <laughs> I'm obviously tracing a journey. Uh, and that was sort of a, the, the way I decided to do this talk. I could go deeper into any one of these studies, but I just wanna reiterate before moving um, on about what I call the flourishing paradigm. So the flourishing paradigm 
uh, for me was really a question of what would it be like to flip the narrative uh, to pro proactively promote positive health and equity um, versus just getting rid of things that are bad? And what would that look like? Um, and I was inspired by Corey Keyes, who some of you may know, looking at this for adults, looking at qualities of flourishing in adults and prediction of death using across similar levels of adversity and illness and showing a 62% uh, increase in death for those that didn't have uh, flourishing qualities. And these are, you know, sort of psychological uh, well-being indicators in many ways. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. But really looking at the absence of risk and illness is not the same as flourishing, that it appears that positive mental health and well-being and flourishing in the way we can talk, I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, is um, on a dual continuum. And that many people who lack any illness or adversity are certainly not flourishing. And many people with a lot of adversity and illness are flourishing, which was what I was really interested in, is what's that about? So if we didn't have a measure of flourishing, we didn't have that to bank against. All we had was indicators of disease and the absence of them was supposedly well-being, but that's actually not true. Well, we didn't know if it was true, but we do know it's true now that there are a lot of kids with special health care needs, sometimes very serious special health care needs who are flourishing. Why? You know, what's going on and how can we really promote well-being and human potential? regardless of the fact that we are all born in different circumstances with different, um, you know, adversities and to not just let that go, but to really be proactive about well-being. So some of the qualities that are in this concept of flourishing include having a sense of meaning and purpose and being and wanting to be engaged in life, sort of despite what's happening, I'm engaged valuing and creating positive relationships, which are so protective, having a positive orientation that even admits the adversity, looking at what are my strengths? What, could, what do I have to rely on? Where are my resources? How can I build resources? What can I still hold on to for hope? And we know the level of hopelessness in this country is very low. And from that, wh where are we gonna go? We've come from lines of people who've been through adversity, otherwise we wouldn't be alive, right? The world's been filled for thousands of years of adversity and we have to keep choosing it. So it's a choice. And seeking to be a part of the solution, even if at any level, valuing that and valuing ourselves um, and working to help know that we all matter every moment we all matter and how can we create um, situations where people's willingness, sense of meaning and flourishing um, is supported by the fact that they're surrounded in a community that values them. So these are some of the characteristics. And in children, we hadn't defined it, what flourishing was. And so I told you before that we looked at um, three factors, curious, being curious and interested in learning, persisting to complete tasks that a child actually began versus giving up really easily or getting really frustrated too easily and resilience. Um, and we found that about 40% of school-aged children in the country met those criteria across, and it varied across states, but it didn't vary as much across income. So as we thought, so publicly insured children about 37.2 and only 45.3. So what is this about that we're, you know, even among children who don't have any health problems or anything, we don't see higher levels of engagement in life, curiosity, uh, goal orientation, um, self-regulation of emotions and behavior, and how could we uh, promote that? And again, finding this equally unequal phenomenon that at different levels uh, at by income, children with two or more ACEs, there was the same impact of ACEs on flourishing. So reaffirming, this was reaffirming the need for a population-based approach and that it's all of us. And that to me is important because otherwise it's very hard in policy when people think it's just those disadvantaged people, but it really is all of us. And um, that's been a very important piece of the story going forward. In terms of the factors, though, looking at, okay, well, what are the specific factors that can promote flourishing amid adversity? So keeping in mind, flourishing is sort of the outcome, right? Like being actually engaged in life and in school and having positive relationships and being goal-oriented is the outcome we had to define. And then we had ACEs and a lot of adversities and health problems. So then the next question is, well, what are the actual factors that might promote 
flourishing amid that adversity. And already we had worked to get um, data in the national survey on parent-child connection, uh, family resilience, knowing you have strengths to draw on. And these are odds ratios for flourishing based on whether a child does or doesn't have these after adjustment. Staying hopeful when things are hard, that you can find family can is able to stay hopeful. Talking together uh, about problems, reaching out for help and get, being willing to reach out and ask for help. Um, and then there were the standard parenting factors like participating in child's activities or having an adult mentor. And what I noticed right away is that the factors that were more about relationships and how we are together, which is I, my understanding of the science really emphasizes that, um, was a lot more, were a lot more impactful. But not only that, in this study, which was um, published in 2016, we saw this cumulative positive phenomenon that it wasn't just one, it, there was no magic bullet, just like there's no magic adverse childhood experience. And everybody's looking for the magic one. Is, is sexual abuse worse than emotional neglect? I mean, you're, it's first of all, everything, things tend to go together, but it's really not the way that the science seems to be looking. It's cumulative negative, cumulative stressors, and also cumulative positive. So the curiosity was, well, maybe we have a positive childhood experiences indicator that's analogous to the ACEs indicator that we could look at. So this was just the very beginning looking at the impact on flourishing with the cumulative effect, regardless of which of the positive factors were there. And there are many more that we'd like to measure, of course. But that was exciting. And um, with all of this, again, after 20 something years, getting all the variables in one place so they could talk to each other, being able to look at um, these positive protective factors, family resilience and parent-child connection to promote flourishing at every level of ACEs and poverty and disability. So those were the three uh, adversities we were looking at, poverty, children with special needs, more complex special needs, disability, and ACEs. And what we found, the same thing for all of the risk factors, but this is just on ACEs, I'm just gonna show you the graph because you can take it, is that for the, the uh, yellow line is four or more ACEs and the blue line are no ACEs. And again, seeing yes, the impact is high, even if you don't have ACEs and you're lacking these positive protective factors, you're still much less likely to flourish. Like it, the, the effects actually, even though the, the intercept is higher or lower based on the risk, the effect size, the odds ratio, the impact was exactly the same for everyone. Again, this is all of us. And even without ACEs, without poverty, without disability, many children are not flourishing and this is what is predicting school engagement in, in life. A lot of health behaviors and things like that are associated as well. So the research is continuing. We're working with the CDC on a whole PCE's uh, study now, um, but there's so much more work to do. <laughs> so I sort of feel like we started where I could start where we are now, but you know we now have to move it forward. But only 48% of children in the country were living in homes that met those criteria of family resilience and parent-child connection. And that speaks to the larger context of our society and the workplaces. And how is it that we have isolated ourselves or built communities that we have to be not needing each other? And which is a back to the whole, we are the medicine concept that it's within and between us and our capacity to nurture each other, even as adults is important. So, sorry. So the last piece that I'm going to show um, for this train of, of, of dialogue is the positive childhood experiences study that we did using Burfus data, which was on adults looking back on their life, just like for ACEs, adults looking back on their life. We had ACEs and PCEs and all the other variables and all the health problems and conditions um, on the table. And we looked at all of them, but we could only publish on a couple things because you can only get so much into 3,000 words. <laughs> so this paper was really looking at, first of all, what are positive childhood experiences? And it's looking like from the prior research, they were more relational than, you know, um, having fun, you know, sort of the things that were really positive experiences when you talk to people are ironically a paradox, which is how was I met? when things were hard, ends up being the most positive thing. What's a positive experience you can remember? I really remember like the hero's journey going through this really hard time and I, the, but these people showed up 
And then I learned and I grew and I overcame. And so the idea of being met with nurturance and support when things are hard turns out to be a very big hit for a sense of having a positive experience. And that maps which atta with attachment theory even, where often our sense of trust builds the most when we're afraid, but then we have somebody we can turn to. And then, you know, some of the neurobiological sciences show jumps and positive things in the brain when there's distress that's met with care. So these are really experiences like feeling able. Now, this is not whether a, a video came in and said, you were able to talk to your family. You just didn't, you just chose not to. No, it's about what you actually experienced and what ended up being experienced in a way that it's been knocking around in your nervous system and identity your whole life. So that by the time you got to be an adult, looking back, you were like, yes, I had that experience. So regardless of what actually may have happened that other people objectively could see, what is my lived experience? And that lived experience, when we look at epigenetics also, is turning on and off our genes. So do I experience positive emotion is part of, you know, laughter therapy, I guess, is something they're using in cancer wars now because it lifts, you know, lifts up the healing response. So even the immune system responds. And so it's the lived experience. And that's why these are about, did you feel this? Not did this thing happen or not happen, which is a little different from ACEs. ACEs is about events and it still packs a punch, but we were really looking at feelings and lived experience. Did you enjoy participating in community events? Not were dragged there and forced to do it. You might say you might've participated in a lot, but did you have a sense of belonging in school? And so that's what we were looking at. And what we found, was many things that are not able to be in one paper, but mostly what we found is a huge effect on adult uh, mental, poor mental health and depression being much lower for those who had at every level of ACEs, who is just similar to the other paper I showed you, but for adults. So 59.7% having um, depression or poor mental health as an adult when they only had zero to two of those lived positive childhood experiences versus 20.7%. And so the, the when the, when you adjust for PCEs, you start to see a lot less variation across different levels of ACEs. And we saw similar things for many health problems and whether you had a, a social and emotional support as an adult, positive adult relationships and so on, but it's too much for today. But the similar patterns. I was telling Jen at breakfast that one of my interests though is that it's not as impactful for some physical health problems. So it definitely, positive childhood experiences look like they're definitely very protective for mental health and some health behaviors and having better relationships as an adult and all those things at ever, other levels of adverse childhood experiences. However, the physical hit may still be there. And so I'm very interested in not polarizing here and saying child abuse and neglect is okay if we can somehow do these, because even when we do, they still pack their punch on the physiology. It's protective, but it doesn't take it away. And I think there's a lot more work to do on how we help to regulate the brain and the body and the toxic stress physiology that can get so ingrained that we can learn skills with our, with our brains and learn to, you know, to how to restore in many ways, but we still have to blend those. And so I'm very interested in, in some of the even biological sciences on the restoration of the nervous system when you've experienced a lot of traumatic stress. So the good news is my, somebody just did this at RAND because they're doing a little synthesis on how much the data went up. So one of the things we've noticed is that when we can create a standardized measure and a way of thinking about it, that other people can really activate a lot of research. So getting back to the data center, liberating data. So my whole career is, you know, well, I'm busy with the whole other project on the DRC and other things. So papers are hard, harder to get to for me but really trying to make them empowering. So here's something that can be a model. And so we've seen a lot more um, studies, but we still have a lot of questions, but it's promising and it's important. What happened as a result of all this was um, the American Academy of Pediatrics. How many of you know about Bright Futures guidelines and preventive and developmental services that are really the law of the land under the Affordable Care Act, all health plans and providers are supposed to deliver comprehensive Bright Futures guidelines-based care and of course, our work was measuring whether that was happening um, and it's not, but they changed through, through the research I just presented along with many other people contributing 
um, we're able to move the statement from toxic stress is the problem to relational health is the solution at a primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention level. And so I've been working a little bit with their team on, um, on, a, on a number of pieces of research to try to examine then relational health as distinct from other social determinants. So mostly we think of social determinants as um, really serious and important gaps in having resources, money, access to um, education, access to food, transportation, um, living in a community where you don't feel safe, being exposed to discrimination of any kind due to who you are, your skin color, your identity. And so we have data on all those. So we also had all those. So we looked really carefully at social and relational. Relational would be like two or more ACEs, uh, very high levels of poor mental health in the home and serious parental distress. And what we found, and it was important to do this to try to build further the story of why is this an issue for healthcare? Why is this an issue for schools? You know, it, I can't deal with social determinants. And there's a, even though we're screening for it, there's a lot of attitude like that out there. And what about and how is it different from relational health? So these were the the topics we looked at. And as you can see here, if you don't have any social risks of the social risks and no relational risks, mental emotional behavioral diagnosis. Um, prevalence was 15.3, and it goes all the way up to 61% if you have two or more of each of those social or relational. But what's important to me was noticing how high um, the prevalence went with no social determinants of health, that there was still a three times basically higher rate. And so this was again getting to the equally unequal concept that I've been talking about. And uh, so we did a lot of analysis to show that about 60% of those with these relational health risks do not have social health risks. And so if we only focus on the, and we need to focus on, but if we only focus on the um, dis more disadvantaged groups to address these issues, we're missing the bulk of the population that's uh, having the problem. And so it's just important as a way to continue to keep it together as a population-based issue for all of us to recognize these are affecting us, whether we're disadvantaged or not in other ways. And so this was an important study that, um, I'm not gonna actually show this part, uh, to say this is all of us, that eliminating risks is not enough. It's important that even if we are gonna eliminate risks, maybe we need to build flourishing and positive things in order to have the resources to eliminate them. Is that what it's about? But also focusing on the family system is not enough. So all the research together is, is really pointing back again to the need for community statewide and um, national efforts and especially getting local, right? That's where things really end up um, packing the punch. So I'm back to the beginning. Basically, I didn't go anywhere. I just took big old research study <laughs> tour. So my my work right now is very much into how can we, um, I'm going to take about, probably about, um, probably about eight more minutes. So we'll be done within, we'll have a half hour hopefully to talk. Um, is to really hone in on something doable. So um, the Congress issued a big uh, early childhood developmental health systems grant to a low income um, high need state to really come up with a framework. And it was Mississippi, the Mississippi Thrive Project. So I was working in Mississippi and only in the last couple of years of their project actually. So they had a five-year project and I came in at about a year and a half before it was over to try to help facilitate bringing together everything they'd learned into a framework that we ended up calling the engagement and action framework. Again, it was positive. And the goal of this framework is positive health equity. That's the goal, positive health and equity in that, looking at flourishing, school readiness, school engagement, family resilience and connection are the things we want to create and then we need to do things to do that. And so that was um, what we called one big doable thing or one bit for short, which was also a strategy. So if people could say, if we could just do this one thing, one big doable thing, we will start to build the habits of working together across sectors. And that will benefit any other issues that we deal with. We need to actually, if we're gonna start working together between child welfare, early intervention, home visiting, um, you know, Head Start, early care and education and healthcare, we need to do something together and not just talk about it. So there's been so much conversation 
about that. And it had a lot of policy elements. So we bring all that together. Um, and the one big doable thing really actually is leveraging an already existing funding stream for well child visits for children zero to five. There's about 55 million of these visits that are supposed to happen. About half of them happen for young children where the big bang for the buck is, it's even lower. Um, we have national data on that. And once you're in the visits, there are nine out of 10 are missing one of very basic screens or health education supports, or even feeling like you had your question, you, you were even asked about your concerns. So that's the re some research that we've done. So we have this thing sitting there <laughs> and yet we can't do a good job without bringing together the sectors, the community resources to address the social and relational factors. So this was sort of the focus area is how can we do that? And these are all of the groups that we worked with and created possibility prototypes for every single one on how is it that from where you are and what you're held accountable for in your programming, working with uh, this engagement action framework can help you meet your goals and how can we do this together? So we worked with all of these different um, efforts in Mississippi to define what was possible and of course, the scientific basis for a lot of this was what, what we're now calling the PACES science, the positive and adverse childhood experiences science, because we want to save time and get the information we need on the table. So by the time we actually meet with families and children, we can focus on building those safe relationships and those trusting relationships, which are so key to successful referrals, to engagement and supports and all of that. But that wasn't happening at the time. So this is just a one pager. This is not going to be a workshop on it, but we do have workshops on it about the purpose, um, you know, getting all kids in through any door uh, with real engagement. Um, and there's a lot of detail in how this works with toolkits, but also the implementation roadmap starting with state and local structures. And that clearly it wasn't going to happen without making sure some of the small P policy, even one of our design parameters in Mississippi was you can't rely on legislative change. That's not going to happen. What can we do with our current programs? And so we really dove deep and identified key barriers in policy that could be addressed, but only if literally the governor said early care and education is going to work with health care and Medicaid was the big uh, need to engage. There's a lot more coordination going on between different state systems and healthcare was kind of left out yet. That's where the money is. That's where they're putting into health plans. That's where the accountability measures are for preventive services in those early years before kids get into school. So, so this is there's a whole roadmap to it all to say, but I'm not going to focus in on all of that so much as just to say that it has all of these components. So when we're developing a framework, a framework needs a lot of elements to it, and it's hard to get there but it's purpose, strategic goals, design parameters, theory of change, how do we work together to come up with that? And so this includes all of that um, and with the through any door approach. And this is kind of my last point, bringing it back to data and IT, is what kept coming up for everyone is if we're gonna work together, we need common ways to engage families to find out what's going on, what their priorities are, what their needs are. As it turns out, the valid way to find that out is you have to ask people, it's surveys. You know, by the time you're in the system, you can see problems, but you're not getting into the prevention. And so how could we do that and share the data across? And electronic medical records are a black box in many ways. Okay, I've worked a lot on them. So how can create a platform to make it possible, not just to share administrative data on who's enrolled and who's getting services, but what are the needs? So we've developed and done um, some evidence-based work on something called the WellVisit Planner, which is an IT-based tool that's directed at families. Um, and it really is the, the main thing that's helping them be able to engage families through any door and share the same family agenda with each other, if that makes sense. So it turns out that data interoperability comes back, IT systems and the need for standardized measures. So it, it sort of all happens. The other big thing was shared accountability. So lots of measures are out there. Um, not asking you to read all this, but just saying that already, whether you look at Medicaid, community health centers, home visiting, Head Start, early intervention, child welfare, they share similar goals already in measures of performance, but none of them are performing. 
And so again, if you align measures and incentives, you can start to get people to work together around something. So that's a big part of this. But I think for me, it's mostly sharing it to say that this is a concept I think that needs to cut across, whether it's early childhood, you know, health promotion and prevention, uh, where we really move upstream, or if it's um, youth or whatever. So I'm going to go ahead actually with uh, the last note, which is about um, using all of these uh, to really address structural racism and all kinds of discrimination. So Mathematica did a study with Robert Wood Johnson on the model that I just shared with you, uh, independent of us, and really said, you know, that the way this was approaching really did feel like communities and families felt like they were given voice and given um, a, a way that their agenda and their goals could be met. So, but it was really through in many ways, having a safe, family-friendly, IT-based tool to share, knowing that somebody was going to get that data that ended up making, making that happen. So there's a lot going on in Colorado. How many of you know about Illuminate Colorado? They're a, they're a part of a Colorado just Department of Early Childhood just won um, some of the money for following up on to implement the Engagement in Action Framework is now zero to three and HRSA funding. And Colorado is one of the awardees. And Illuminate Colorado is one of the groups that's working closely on this as well. But I'm super interested in finding out what's going on from your point of view and how you're already involved in these efforts to try to really um, leverage the opportunity for very early life primary prevention um, along the life course as well. So I just wanted to let you know that that was happening and um, I'm not gonna go through, I'm gonna move forward actually. All right, so this is my last few comments. So we have 70 years of good data on linking safe, stable, nurturing relationships and experiences of being cared and nurtured to health. And so we can talk about that, but we still don't have the evidence that we need. There's some more for early childhood, which is why I think we can act, but we have a long way to go to really document and do the research. There's a lot of good things happening out there that aren't being researched. So for me, it's really important that we always combine those innovations with research um, we still have a lot of burnout that's going on where this, the system itself is in distress. And those are really key issues of how do we build capacity and sustainable workforce. And uh, yet we've come a long way. So this is a, po have anyone seen this poster from the Child Welfare Association in 1919 saying that nothing that ever happened to a child could actually ever impact them? But the mother's um, milk might be impacted by her stress levels. So she should be very calm and happy. And so this was literally a national poster that was put out. So when I look at this, I think we've come a long way. But at the same time, we are seeing not the uptake of the science of child abuse, adversity, and flourishing translated. And Dick Krugman talks about gaze aversion. And in the plate tectonics, the explanation, because I dug into it for why this well-described theory wasn't being taken up, is that they couldn't fathom it was possible. It theoretically was possible, but it didn't seem like it could be happening. And so are we at that place now of having a lot of possibility, but we don't believe ourselves. We don't believe in ourselves that we can do something about it. So we have a long way to go. About half of the population thinks that child abuse and neglect and child well-being is an issue. That's not a lot. Um, a fewer uh, legislators have ever even heard about this science. This is a, the most recent study I could find. And even when they have heard about it and they understand childhood experiences affect our health across life, it's really sexual abuse. You know, again, not looking at the, it's not the event, it's the experience and the toxic stress and the accumulation. So child neglect, not getting a lot of support. So it's really breaking it up still into a disease model. So we have a long way to go in our policy world. Um, and finally, who, who do we blame? We're still blaming parents in many ways. So there's a lot of two gen, three gen, intergenerational trauma issues that are at play. And so we need to stay the course. And that's why I'm uh, very interested in having a conversation with you about continuing in these areas um, in this body of work, um, which obviously connect to everything else. So I'm going to stop right now and um, see if there's any questions.
I have my six wishes that I was going to end with, but I feel the compulsion to stop because I want to have at least 25 minutes to talk. Unless you want me to give you my six wishes, which are... Are you with me? <laughs> You're lucky I didn't start reading poetry because I usually do that. Um, <laughs> but um, it's a lot, I know. But um, so I've tried to translate the neurobiology sciences into sort of action for policy and um, to move this we are the medicine paradigm shift that we're still on. Um, forgive my lingo, I have lots of lingo. But to really take prevention, healing and flourishing to scale. And the first is to free our brilliance by aligning our financing with values. And so I'm working on the National Academy of Science Committee right now on improving child and youth well-being through health systems transformation. And this is the number one issue, right? And the next one, taking on transparency, actually measuring what matters, linking it to money and being in a loop of learning. So we don't just measure it once a year and hide in a box. We actually use real-time data feedback loops to be interested in how it's going and learn from each other because some people are doing better than others. So taking on uh, transparency and creating a healthy alert system. So we have our reward system and our alert system and then becoming we ninjas. That's just what I think of. We're not that good at it. We still, we get in a room and we try to collaborate and there's always a, a dynamic leader. And how do we really, really, really make sure that we create sustainable um, collaborative partnerships where we fully engage the affiliative system and go from fixing to connecting to realize that we can do transactional policy. We're brilliant. We can come up with tactics for how to improve a system. We have so many reports on if we did this, this would happen. And we know a lot about that, but it's not happening because it has to happen through people and partnerships. And so I think there's a lot to do here to um, really keep supporting and building a sustainable community and statewide partnerships and others. Prioritize possibilities to remember there's more right than will ever be wrong. When I ask people that question, most people say they don't agree. So I think that tells me we need to really decide how we want to choose to see possibility because that will dictate what we get. And uh, we have we live in a hard world, but we have possibility and there are pockets of possibility and people who who move forward in life well tap into that. And so we need to do that as a safe place to take on the trauma. I think taking on trauma without being resourced or knowing there's possibility can be really re-traumatizing. And um, it's one of the ways that in practices for pediatricians asking about positive experiences can be a safe way. And if they're not, they're saying, well, what do you know about what might be in the way of that? And then people share. And it's not like a, a an ACEs exam, if you will. Um, and then to brave being, again, getting to that I, you, me, and who I am in every moment is what's making possible that next moment of possibility and connection and positive partnership. So who we are, we is very important. And one little example is when we did our a clinical study on the we on the Wellvisit Planner, we had a script that every clinician used in a clinic with 26 doctors. They all used the same thing but we had a response rate from families of 35 to 85%. And it all had to do with the energy and the spirit of the person that was inviting the family using the same exact words. So it really is again, empowering, which I think is exciting, the importance of every single one of us and how we affect each other every moment through what's living within us. And so practicing that your being, their well-being platform is important. Those are my six wishes. That's it. That was really good. <laughs> so we still have time for some talk. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Was a great talk. And we do we have time for questions and those of you who yeah. are online, if yeah. you um could enter any questions in the QA, we're keeping an eye on that as well. So um yeah, yeah. please. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see people. I know I had an hour and a half and I tried to keep it to an hour. So I'm very interested in who's online um, and who's in the room. I'm taking a minute. I'm taking a minute to be. <laughs> yeah. So um, you may or may not be aware that Colorado has a very high rate of homeschooling. And I'm wondering within your model what you think about that. Oh, wow. Okay. So the question was that Colorado has a high rate of homeschooling. And in this model, what I think about that. Okay. So, I mean, 
measuring school engagement, by the way, is not done for homeschool for kids who are homeschooled. Um, and it was, and then it wasn't, but because there was a lot of concern about the confounding of that. So I think it's um, something that I, I would love to talk about, but I think that it is true that institutionalized children are also not part of the data sets that we measure. So we need to do that separately. And we probably need a um, partnership with the families that are involved in homeschooling to find out how to engage them in their own curiosity um, out of care for their children and in a way that feels supportive of them to, to learn about this. And if not, then we probably need to have people who work with children in healthcare and other settings be curious about that so that if they're seeing anything, um, they can be aware of it. So I think, um, I think this is one of the unfortunate pieces is we didn't get to look at home children who are homeschooled, but we can look at who are homeschooled and the various variations in that using the data that I shared. And there are some studies on that and there are some distinct differences in the uh, profiles of kids who, who are homeschooled and not. What do you think? I don't know what to think. Yeah, <laughs> but it's an issue. It sounds like, I mean, that's, I see so that's why it's all local. I didn't know that about Colorado. I mean, I could have known it. I could go on our own website and find out. But <laughs> yeah. I think that it's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, not only we don't know, but um, people come to that from so many different places. And, yeah. Um, it's always sort of this um I've given up telling parents they shouldn't homeschool which I think you've given up what I don't think getting that's not a good thing to homeschool I, I okay don't know that I ever did do that but I definitely don't do it anymore um because for lots of reasons but I have no idea what it means for social engagement kind yeah of. so just noting that we don't know a lot and um but it's a big thing and we need to address it and you're not sure what to do. And yeah, I mean, the, again, there are studies of how children fare on all the things I was talking about if they are not homeschooled, because we do have that data. So that might be something to really look at in Colorado using the National Survey of Children's Health. You could at least get at that like really quickly. And I haven't seen anything on that. So this is why it's so important to liberate the data because that question is really important. But, you know, I'm not going to think of all the important questions you're going to know. Yeah. What else? Question from online. Okay. Uh, Lynn Barley. Okay. What work have you done that centers or includes community in place in the understanding of the problems and solutions? I love your ecosystem concept. Okay. Um, so just generally speaking, what communities? Uh, what work have you done that centers or includes community in place in the understanding of the problems? Okay. You know, when, by in place, Gwen, what do you mean by in place? Do you mean oh, just... So it includes community and place. Oh, yeah, definitely. I would say most of the work that I've done with states or communities over the years has all been like that, um, but including people in the community, because that's been a hallmark of our work is making sure we start with community voices and family voices at this actually first before going to stakeholder and expert voices, that's been a part of the pattern. So in all the measures that I shared with you, they were created that way. And so it's really important that we listen. And um, certainly in Mississippi, that was a big, that's why it took so long <laughs> was that, but um, the ecosystem is really the statement that we have these concentric circles of any ecological model that are impacting our ability to do the right thing locally if we want to. So we have to look at it as a system. So Gwen, I'm not sure I'm answering your question because it's pretty broad, but maybe you could speak and I can do a better job. Yes. Okay. She wants to speak? Yes. Oh no, she said you are answering. Okay, question. good, good, yeah. good. Yeah, I mean, and I think that that's why I said the engagement action framework is just a, but it actually is very specific to that one big doable thing of can we get all children from the day they're born into excellent health promotion and prevention services where we will find out what's going on with the family. You know, if we could get 
OBGYN and pediatrics to work together, we could, we should start earlier, but at least we know there and it's funded and it's there, but it's not happening. And so if we can hone in on that, but that's a framework just for that, but you can apply the same concepts. That's why I shared the, the, the elements of the framework are not different than if you were doing a framework on, you know, youth school engagement, you know, there's a similarity to the approach. Yeah. What else? Hi, Shale. <laughs> I can see your see a couple of people's names here. Yeah. Thank you. I have a um, that was great. Really enjoyed it. Um, my work is in community health workers and patient navigation, and I was really interested in your seven C's. Yeah. Slide, which um, because we're kind of all over the place in your bubbles. Like we started with credentialing and li licensing, and now with CMS initiatives, we're yep. going back to cost and to cost and payment. Yeah. So um, I'm just curious if you could share um, your thoughts over the last decade, it sounds like, in terms of um, barriers in that journey, um, how the data has played a role, and just kind of your perspective, um, you know, looking back and to give us some ideas of what to And are you working at the interface between healthcare and community? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I would say there's a lot of professional barriers. Uh, for one thing, we've worked with home visitors and community health workers and doulas and family specialists and healthcare. And this is that through any door using similar measures, using interoperable data sharing, because a lot of what the community health workers, family specialists, home visitors are using are not tools that the providers recognize or feel are valid. And they don't trust that they're going to be done in a valid way, which was why the IT platform is so powerful because you don't have to be an expert in doing developmental screening or screening for whatever it's done. It's done. The whole focus is on connecting with the patient or with the client and then sharing that data using a similar set of tools that can be um, create a common language. So that's one thing is just sheer professional uh, rejection of home visitors doing all the screening so that kids can come in to well visits prepared and then not having it be rejected by the provider and they redo it. And so there's a lot of relationship building um, and, you know, uh, deference to expertise, really having some professionals that have a higher level of expertise in terms of their licensing or credentialing, respecting the expertise of people who are working at a different level. Um, and one of the ways to neutralize that is to make sure that everyone trusts the process and the procedures and the data systems. Um, the other is the slow train of recognizing the importance of these whole whole health factors, the social factors, the relational factors that are not going to be magically addressed through clinical care and medicines, right? And the need for each other. And so now CMS is, um, you know, allowing health, Medicaid can allow health plans to pay for community health workers to hire. They don't aren't doing it because they don't they put incentives in enough. But where it is being done, it's it's effective. We need to research it like crazy. There's 250 community health centers that have money right now to use family specialists to improve well visits in contact with the community. So we need to be on that. But I think that the professional issues, the measurement issues, and then also crit, um, uh, quality training, you know, having like without having to overburden the system and create too many barriers to entry for becoming a community health worker or a family specialist, because a lot of times in Mississippi, anyway, if you were a home visitor and wanted to get credentialed, you had to pay for it yourself. But they were being paid minimum wage. They, and they hardly ever got paid on time. And early intervention specialists as well. So this huge lack of valuing workers who are really the ones who can reach people in the community and not paying them well enough and not giving them easy access to training and supports is another big thing. But ultimately, it has to be paid for and rewarded. And that is happening a lot more for adults. Huge gap in CMS's activities for adults versus kids because of the fact that Medicaid is largely a state-run program. Um, so those are some of the things, but there's more, obviously, but those are big ones. And then having like actual MOUs. So we create MOUs between a community-based resource broker and a doctor that, you know, we can actually create, okay, we're out here, you're over there. Occasionally, we're going to have patients that come to us first, and we'd like to share this with you and just having some kind of agreement, but that's time. And a lot of clinics are overwhelmed and busy. They don't even have time to take a phone call. So creating the workforce that is the interstitial tissue of collaboration. And that's why collaboration was in the seven C's. 
that has to be there. Like there is somebody who's working on creating the agreements between the different agencies and the uh, different service sectors. So they can get into a conscious agreement with each other yeah. Yeah. and learn how it's going and be in a little bit of a CQI process around that. Right. That's where we're at right now. So yeah, okay, thank you so much for sharing. And, and just a quick note about Colorado is we are one of the first states to uh, independent of what's happening in CMS to be providing reimbursement for CHW and Navigator. So we're kind of a fruitful ground. for. Well, I'm so interested in that just personally, and also how to empower. I, I started, but I didn't go as far back as my undergraduate education, <laughs> but I did, I ran the peer health counselor program at UCLA and we were, uh, we were working with the medical school we were peer frontline people and we were able to do so much. We were trained by the school of public health. And I am so interested in not community health workers or, or trained professionals, but also just peer workers. And how can we really, um, especially since so much of it is relational and trust and feeling seen and, you know, nurse family partnerships, 85% of people drop out before it's over. And Congress is like, how, why should I fund more services when they're underused right now? Because they are. And so it's a very big dilemma for us that we have services, we need more, we need more people to be using services. And if all the people who needed them were using them, we don't have enough, but we still end up with this big engagement issue of how to engage people, activating the will to be well, the capacity to act. Um, and that's where I think it comes back to having trusting relationships and, and partners who walk the walk with us, you know, like a community health worker. Very, so important. Thank you so much. Yeah. What about you over there? <laughs> yeah, what are you thinking over there? I mean, I'm thinking about like the work I used to do with school systems. Yeah. And, like where that, you know, because they're, they're asking for the same kind of question. Yeah, definitely. And, I mean, again, coming up with their own measures, you know, mm -hmm. like rural superintendents coming up with their own measures about engagement with yeah. families and, you know, and then like, yeah, like, mm -hmm. is, there, is there a way to like, but that's what the engagement and action framework is about. Yeah. And also in our national academies study school based uh, for school age kids. So part of the, in the enact framework, we started with zero to five because before you're in school, you really do go to healthcare a lot <laughs> yeah. and the money's flowing there, but for school, we need to put a lot more in school and then create, if we have shared accountability measures, common ways of assessing things, unless there's a neat reason not to, that really helps a lot to have a communication. And when I'm assessing something differently, but I think education has actually led the way in terms of engagement and family engagement, whole person, whole child models, they are way ahead of healthcare. Uh, having said that, when I was at the University of Chicago, most of my statistical training for multi-level methods and things that could look at effects of neighborhood school versus teacher versus neighborhood system were in the School of Education. So I think education is is kind of ahead of us in many ways, yeah, but, but they need to connect. Yeah, yeah, they do, because as soon as you, in Ohio, they have uh, child welfare schools and healthcare working together, and they've actually reduced the PICU admissions to the point where the hospital's like, we're going to have to fire a PICU nurse. That's actually going to be not good for our uh, uh, union conversations. Like there's a fear, like if you do too good of a job, healthcare is going to stop needing to do things. But they um, had to work together because kids weren't going to school. Uh, they were often drugged on Abilify in child welfare and they weren't going into healthcare. And so they work together and the kids are going to school. There's, they're getting their preventive services. They're not, if they don't need to be on drugs and they're getting supports. So there's a huge amount of possibility, thousands points of light, more than a thousand points I mean, of light. Like they're, they're, they're measuring it already. Is there a way to like- That's right. Together? It's intention of the leaders and the time and the interstitial tissue of the people who can take the time to make those connections happen. And then once they're going and rolling, it won't be so much work, but we have to invest in that change management and, and do that work. And in some parts of the country, they're doing it more, but that schools have to be on the front lines of the prevention and health promotion. And, and they're going to need healthcare because there's a lot of kids, you know, with a lot of health problems right now. Yeah. Sadly. But I was just curious what you were thinking. I knew you were thinking. Yeah. Yeah. No, I... <laughs> We have another question okay. online from Shannon. Okay, good, good. Um, she says, so happy to have you back in Colorado. Mm. You touched on so much that we need to unpack. To start, yeah. 
do do you want to share a bit about how you're getting your data to policymakers? Oh, absolutely. Well, first of all, we need like a whole funded effort just for that. So as you know, we all have hundreds of jobs and I work with the National, National Prevention Science Coalition, if you know who they are, and also the Campaign for Trauma-Informed Policy and Practice. So I try to, and also Family Voices and a number of other groups. And so I work really closely with them to make sure that they we create lots of issue briefs that are legislatively oriented, that put the data for the state on every single page so you can hand it out to every senator and every congressman. It's a lot of tailoring, but that's the power of our data center actually is it's not, we can actually do that pretty quickly, um, but we need a little bit more funding to do that. But being able to put together translatable um, materials using the data and the stories together. And so, Shale, that's one way. Other thing is hearings and just walk in the pavement. And there's a lot of lack of um, time and awareness. So if you can work with those that are the trusted brokers in any policymaking setting and, and work with them in depth, and that's been one of the most important things for me is working with, for example, I, I'm allowed to name his name, uh, the president of the Children's Hospital Association, really a deep dive on teaching them and their staff about the science of child development and ACEs and mental health and all of that. And then they're the ones that go forward with that. And then I'm on, I, I'm in the wing at their back, which is really kind of the role that I've played is when Family Voices is trying to do the Family Medical Leave Act or CAPTA services are coming up, you know, we try to be available, but there needs to be more funding and support for that translation of data. We're sitting on a gold mine. I think there's a commercial with that. I used to use that term before the commercial came out. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? A sitting on a gold mine commercial. Anyway, I happened to see it one day. <laughs> oh, darn. Um, so, Shell, I'd love to talk with you about that because it seems to me that um, with the turnover in legislator and policymakers, we need a public private partnership or a private sector group that's going to stay sustainable for every time there's a new person in a leadership role that they get brought up to speed, that we don't start over with all new, you know, expertise and we really create that sustainable infrastructure lo locally, states and nationally. Thank you. We have and also the papers that I do are are directed in my mind toward like I try to write them. That's just my little tiny because it's not a huge amount, but try to write them so that a common person could get them and read them and understand what it means. And so I do think how we do research so it can be read is really important because that all you're going to get is an abstract read. So making your research translatable. Yeah. We have another question from online. Oh, good. Uh, from Chelsea Wesner. Okay. Um, thank you so much for sharing it with us today. I really enjoyed it. I can't help but wonder what you think about the recent branding of early relational health mm. and leveraging of well child visits for screening. It seems you've been working in the space for at least a decade. Are you seeing any synergy with your work and the groups pushing forward the early relational health? <laughs> well, I mean, our research that I showed you today gave them the impetus to do that with the AAP. And I've known Dave Willis since I was 23 years old. So yes, I know the people. And I think that um, it's very, it's completely synergistic with everything we're doing. So early relational health is critical and an opportunity for that is the well visit, but not if you're spending all your time collecting data and not meeting with the family and knowing what their priorities are. And so you can't do what we call a personalized connected encounter, which is where you would promote early relational health using the, the strategies, um, unless you can solve for the problem of actually making time for that and creating resources. So the whole, all that work is completely synergistic. Um, and so there, that whole team and, and, and I'm again, a kind of like an Intel inside person, <laughs> you know, I shoot them data and research and, and that sort of thing. But the ENACT framework actually is um, based on promoting uh, early relational health and flourishing and family resilience and connection and needing to solve for making time to really meet families, know what their goals and priorities are and building trust and working with other sectors. So it's very connected. But the fact that it seems disparate on the outside worries me still. And I think that's just good old fashioned um, I don't know if it's intentional, but I think that when we're all working together, when I feel like I'm working with that group really closely and I'm part of that group even, um, but it doesn't look that way to the outside, it can create confusion. 
And so I think that's actually a meta question for public health and communication. That's partly why communication was on that seven C's list as well, is how do we communicate about important things so people aren't swamped with 10 different versions of the same thing and can't make their way through. Um, and that's partly why the ENACT framework was done too. So we gave language that was similar for early intervention and child welfare and early care and healthcare to use. So at least they could have some conversation on a playing field. They understood what the rules of the game were or what the factors were or what the game was. <laughs> so, yeah, I'd love to, I want to talk with all of you more and I'm excited that, um, that you're uh, seeing the connections. Uh, we, we have such big work to do. Yeah. So. I'm very interested in the next generation as well because of that, because, you know, I'm not, I'm, I've got plenty of time left in me, but I also feel really strongly about education and training and interdisciplinary education and multi -dis. So I teach a class that has doctors and nurses and undergraduates and MPH students of all kinds. And it really feels like this content area we're talking about has relevance for all of them. And that when they work together to learn, it's very powerful. So I don't, I'm assuming you do it interdisciplinary training on the campus, but I'd love to know what you're doing here. So yeah, are we done? Oh, we're done. Yeah. Oh yeah, the time has left. Okay, great. Thank you. So Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody online Thank as well. Everyone who joined online. Yeah. And uh, we have food coming in. I know a lot of the CDH faculty, I think we're planning to have stay and have lunch with you. And so okay. we're bringing food into the room. And so if you, you know, great. It should be in here any moment. So if you can make yourselves comfortable and yeah, find maybe find a spot where it makes sense. Good. Now I'm going to keep drinking water because I've drank so much water since I landed. I've just been instantly yeah. dehydrated. So, okay. Thank you. And I'll see you later, uh, Dick and Shale, um, I think, and maybe some others. So I'm going to go ahead and shut the meeting down.